Welcome to All My God Ministries. I am your host, Reverend Anita Morris, and I won't be before you long, but this is a significant week. It is the week of Holy Week, and also on Good Friday. Sometimes we say it's Good Friday, but it's not so good when we know that an innocent man, fully man, fully God, who was crucified, buried for our sins, who was giving a uh, a totally devastation of horrific death um, and so it's hard to grasp that something devastation just like what you could think about the devastation of fires devastation of shootings that has happened in recent years of celebration of this holy week of such forgiveness given to humanity and which rock our hearts rock our world um, so just think of the goodness of Jesus and the totality of his blood shed for you in the forgiveness of your sins, our sins, the sins of for all humanity. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for giving up your son for us all. And there's not an easy thing when a father can give up a son for the entire saving of the world and this is not a myth this is our faith that we have received and we have accepted by an act of our own belief and that that faith is proven and tested as we walk our daily lives and as Jesus spoke to a lot of witnesses when he walked the earth and said to many of those souls that were being saved souls that were being restored souls that were being healed saying your your faith has healed you and also there's forgiveness of your sins so i want to thank you lord most of all for the faith that you have given me to believe to have forgiveness of sins and to also to thank you for healing our nations healing our families healing our infirmities and all of those things that you have done that we don't take note every day we thank you I thank you and all these things I give you thanks in Jesus mighty name thank God amen so I made a little note here and the title of this message today is forgiving is the greatest of the passionate acts of Jesus forgiving or forgiveness of sins or forgiving is the greatest of the passionate acts you can look at that within yourself you can look at it when we look at the Gospel of Luke and we will read from the Gospel of Luke chapter 23 verse 38 through 54 Gospel of Luke 23 38 through 54 and this is again to recognize the passionate week of Jesus as we embark on Easter Sunday we call it Resurrection Sunday as we approach Good Friday and also going to Resurrection Sunday and celebration. But right now, it's the ramification that surrounded the death of our Christ, our Lord and Savior. Luke 23, verse 38 through 54. And it reads, For there was also an inscription above him, which is Christ, in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was suspended kept up railing at him, saying, Are you not the Christ, the Messiah? Rescue yourself and us from death. Isn't that mindful of many when they know that you have been sent 
but they refuse and reject your, your calling, reject the forgiveness of sins, but they see you suffering and they mock you and say, save yourself. And this is what was happening to Jesus right on the cross. But the other one who was on the cross also, another insurrectionist who was with Jesus and the other person, it said the other one reproved him saying, do you not even fear God? Because he was mocking Christ Jesus, our God in Christ Jesus. It says, do you not even fear God seeing you yourself are under the same sentence of condemnation and suffering the same penalty? Although uh, Christ our Lord was not an insurrection, was not a criminal, but had to die a criminal death. And so this person who was edifying Christ and saying, you should not have done that. And it says, we indeed suffer. He continued to say, we indeed suffer it justly, receiving the due reward of our actions. So he admitted that this is was the consequences of our sins, of our own actions. But this man who was Christ, has done nothing out of the way, nothing strange, eccentric, or perverse, or unreasonable. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember. Zakar in Hebrew means remember. Zakar, remember me when you come in your kingly glory. And he answered him, Jesus answered him, Truly, I tell you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Isn't that remarkable? The forgiveness right instantly. Today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour of midday, and darkness enveloped the whole land and earth until the ninth hour, about three o'clock in the afternoon, being supposed to be as bright as ever at that time was all filled with darkness and Jesus crying out with a loud voice said father into your hands I commit my spirit and with these words he expired he died or some would say he gave up the ghost his life his, his spirit to God in verse 47, now the satyrian, having seen what had taken place, recognized God and thanked and praised him and said, indeed, without question, this man was upright, just and innocent. And all the throngs that had gathered to see this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned to their homes, beating their breasts of all that guilt for what had happened, what took place, beating their breasts. <clears throat> and all the acquaintances of Jesus and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance and watched these things. Now notice there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea he was a member of the council of the Sanhedrin and a good, upright, and advantageous man in the sight of God, who had not agreed or assented to the purpose and action of the others. And he was expecting and waiting for the kingdom of God. The Sanhedrin always disagreed with Jesus. We call him the religious sect, but Joseph was not a part of that. He never assented to that. But he was a private follower of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, our Lord. And then he took it down and rolled it up in a linen cloth for swathing deed, for swathing dead bodies and laid him in a rock hewn tomb where no one had ever yet been laid before. It was 
the day of preparation, the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was dawning, uh, was quickly approaching. Okay, so even though he was a private follower, follower of Jesus, he still was able to show his reverence for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, forgiveness of sin, when we think of the aspects of forgiveness, we relate in terms of removal or liberation of guilt. We also think in terms of reconciliation of people to God and to each other. We also can think about restoration of renewed or the effects of starting off onto a fresh start or being let go from the offenses one may have caused through sin. So think of some times in your life where you fully grasped and you fully was rewarded by your own actions of forgiving someone or some person for an uh, uh, act. Your very own actions demonstrated forgiveness and you reconciled. Did it bring forth a liberation of, of, of freedom to that other person? Did it reconcile your hearts to God, to each other? Did it restore or renew a relationship? And just beloved to know that Jesus, God in Christ Jesus, fully God, fully man, is always seeking to save which is lost. That which we find in the Gospel of Matthew eighteen eleven, And also when you think about when Jesus spoke to the disciples in parables, he gave them an, uh, uh, what do you call it? A parable of the lost sheep. And they said out of 100 sheep, one went missing and, and there remained 99. Would you not go after that one? And so even God said, I seek that which is lost. And we would read that from the book of Luke, verse chapter 15, and that is three through five. Again, the gospel of Luke 15, three through five. So he told them this parable. What man of you, if he has a hundred sheep and should lose one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness desert and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his own shoulders, rejoicing because he found that one lost sheep. And when he gets home, he summons together his friends, his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me because I have found my sheep which was lost. Thus I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one especially wicked person who repents, changes his mind, abhorring his errors and misdeeds and determines to enter upon a better course of life than over 99 righteous persons, as the Sanhedrin, who have no need of repentance. That's not my word. That's the gospel, y'all. That is what God is seeking to save that which is lost and have a minute of need for Christ. And those whom God seeks will embrace his arms and say, here I am. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I have not sought you. I did not seek you out, but you came to save which I was lost deep in sin in the what they call it Mary clay dirt and sin thick and God rescued you freed you liberates you from guilt 
and sin causing disease. What man is this? What God is this? Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. To God be the glory. Who but God can do this? So remember, I'm going to iterate Luke chapter 15, verse 7. Thus I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one especially wicked person who repents, changes his mind, hating his errors and misdeeds, and determines, fixed, focused, determined to enter upon a better course of life than over 99 righteous persons who have no need of repentance. And that, my beloved, is forgiveness of our sins. All have come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. There's not one that is good and sins not, God says. No, not one that does good and sin not. And as Good Friday approaches this, two, tw this year of 2019, what are some things to be thankful that we ourselves or our community at large or even our nation should be appreciative for receiving reconciliation or forgiveness, being free from many offenses? caused by our humankind destructiveness. Can you think of some of the things? Things which we know our communities delayed or some things that we have not attended to ourselves or some things that we were just stubborn and we just gave a deaf ear and we, didn't, we did not listen with our whole heart because we had to deal and was working with our own issues, couldn't get ourselves out the way. So therefore, we were, um, what do you call it, deliberately being disobedient and not able to operate in God's love for others and for our nation, for the communities at large. So let us think about the things that we see on the news at large or we have seen in the past of Flint, Flint Michigan is one of the areas that we may have delayed help as a nation. Puerto Rico, which have been um, despised in cer certain areas and arenas, or delayed care or lack of care, or within our communities of Massachusetts or what have you, of maybe could be relation to um, disproportionate of of education or privilege those that are less than or or those that are could be hindered by other tax situations or what have you or whatever may be the findings in certain communities through corruptions of, of the unknown that I'm not really in that field of political realm but whatever you see that it's injustice being done and no one's saying anything about it. That, my beloved, that's something that's a working of God's grace to give communities an opportunity to reconcile themselves to God and to work for the harmony and to unity of the betterment of the whole for the entire community at large. So only you know what's particular in your community, your state, your local town that has been affected by any areas of injustices. Now, in marriage and relationships, God asks and require us to forgive one another, even as we have been forgiven. And that's found in Ephesians 4.32. We will read from Ephesians chapter 4.32. So this is a good passage when you are embarking on conflict in relationships, whether it's marriage, whether it's partnership, or whether it's uh, business, you guys don't agree, don't see eye to eye, or you, you know your boss don't see eye to eye, but you guys made reconciliation, 
and you guys are able to move forward in the common goal of the whole. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 reads, And become useful and helpful and kind to one another. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. It says, And become useful and helpful and kind to one another, tenderhearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted, all of those, right? Forgiving one another readily and freely as God in Christ forgave you. That is our requirement. Become useful, helpful, kind to one, one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And even Jesus said, this is what I give you, the Spirit, and breathe on them the Holy Spirit. He says, those who you forgive, they are forgiven. Those who you remit forgiveness, those that you do not want to have forgiveness, they're not forgiven. So it's up to us, beloved believers, to continue to exercise that as an act of grace to one another, act of the grace of God and God's mercy, and to know that God's been merciful upon us, can we also offer that to others? And some instances and some actions that are very severely harmful and traumatizing, sometimes you don't want to bring that into a foyer of complete reconciliation back to right relationship back in that community. It might be something between you and God that have to be repaired and may take a long a long or a lifetime to do of the heart but sometimes God can just remove that instantly by an act of his grace and his mercy toward the survivor who lived through it only God knows how he affects change of the severely harmed persons of great trauma and some people have encountered great great release great liberty of having their sins forgiven and also being the the um what do you call it the person who gave the forgiveness was released and said hey i wasn't able to be free until i forgave this person and i was liberated it helped them more so than the other person and i'm i marvel at times when i see people who have done certain things in this world and the survivor have brought total forgiveness to the foyer. And it's remarkable, a total act of God's grace and only can be demonstrated through God's grace. Finally, beloved, I'm going to read from the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospel by the general editor, Joe B. Green, okay? This is a historical, um, Contemplation that we study in seminary, um, biblical scholars, the dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels. And I, I will read from the theme of forgiveness of sins. Now, the person who wrote this article in the DJTB, DJTG, uh, page 284, forgiveness of sins. His name is F.S. Spencer, so we're going to credit this to him. Forgiveness of sins, rendering terms closely associated with freedom, a release of letting go. You ever hear somebody, just let it go. Just just let it go. And so, like I mentioned, certain things you just have to work through the process. It's not easily to let go but as we read different passages of Ephesians 4 23 be tenderhearted forgiven one another sometimes it's the God's grace operates differently in other people to each one has been given a measure of grace a measure of faith for this we were saved by grace a gift of God not of ourselves we cannot boast so we have begin been giving a gift of faith according to God's measure so I can't go ahead and say, you have the same measure of God's faith as I do. Everybody has their own measure of faith 
as God given to us by his Holy Spirit. Okay, so everybody will operate in that unique spiritual realm as God has allowed them to walk in the development of their spiritual house, their spirituality and faith with God. Rendering them terms closely, so this, these terms are associated with the forgiveness of sins, freedom, release, letting go, forgiveness. Those are all related to forgiveness of sin. Again, freedom, release, letting go, forgiveness. And the Gospels represents less a static, judicial concept of expunging a record of transgression as we read in the Passion Week of Jesus when he was on the cross and one of the criminals mentioned and, and said, you are an innocent man and can I be with you? Or, you know, and Jesus said, you will be with me this day in paradise. Immediately the forgiveness, the expunging of his record was cleared. And that's what God is seeking to save, which is lost. And this is what he's describing. The expunging a record of transgression, then a dynamic, social, psychological experience of being released from the deleterious effects of guilt, okay? And sinful behavior and restoring broken relations between human beings and God and among themselves. Forgiveness thus most closely aligns with liberation, salvation, reconciliation, and restoration. Because of humankind's deeply flawed nature, forgiveness ultimately depends on the gracious love of God mediated through Jesus Christ. But Far from being passive recipients, people respond to God's reconciling mercy in various ways, how we respond to it, especially repentance, baptism or confession, prayer and forgiveness of others. Everyone will respond differently and uniquely. But these practices appear intimately in gospel accounts and more as correlates to strict prerequisites of forgiveness. So those are different things that some tradition embrace before you can have forgiveness or total forgiveness. But we know that once Christ has forgiven you, you are liberated, you have set free. But upon each other, when you're working with each other, excuse me, that really depends upon individuals but it is still, excuse me, an act of God's grace and his unique forgiveness operating in humankind, God working with humankind. So that is it for the resurrection and forgiveness of our sins. And that is the greatest passion. One of the themes of the greatest passion of Jesus to have forgiveness of our sins. Amen and amen. The Lord be with you. The Lord smile upon you and keep you. Until we, until we meet again. God bless.